I would bet that even you, dear viewer, hold at least some beliefs that are completely disproven by science. The vast majority of Americans hold at least some views that are completely scientifically disproven. We aren't just talking about climate change deniers or evolution deniers. Some of the biggest widespread public opinions that are totally disproven by science have to do with our food. This was highlighted in a recent Pew Research poll that found that some of the biggest growing gulfs between science and public opinion has to do with GM crops or genetically modified crops. This study showed that over 60% of people feel that GM crops are potentially dangerous, whereas 88% of scientists believe that GM crops are perfectly safe. So what's the truth about GM crops? Are they safe or not? Believe it or not, there has actually been no scientific evidence whatsoever that genetically modified foods pose any danger to people who eat them, to animals who eat them, usually livestock, or to the environment. And in fact, science has shown quite the opposite. To date, there have been thousands of studies looking at literally billions of data points on whether or not GM crops pose any danger whatsoever. And recently, there were some meta-analyses that analyzed data from literally thousands of studies, and they found, again, no measurable danger in any way coming from GM crops. In fact, GM crops might be one of the best things for the environment to come around in the last 20 or so years. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and the EPA have both agreed that GM crops have been one of the best ways that the U.S. has been able to reduce its pollution output. In 1990, for example, farming constituted about 20% of the nation's total pollution. By 2012, that number dropped down to 9%. And this is also accounting for the fact that total U.S. pollution has actually gone down, which means that farming pollution has gone down more than the national averages in things like car pollution and industrial pollution, which have also gone down. Why is this the case? Well, GM crops are really energy efficient. They often take less land to produce the same amount of crop output. They require fewer pesticides, which is great for not contaminating water supply and ground supply. They require less tilling, which often destroys the ecosystems and soil. And they even require less water. So in lots of different ways, GM crops are really a boom to the environment. A recent study looked at the effects of GM crops over a span of 10 years and over 6,000 acres on surrounding environments. And they actually found that when GM crops were planted, surrounding wildlife boomed. There were less pesticides on the farm plants, which would then leak into the water supply and surrounding soil. And also these new GM crops helped to reduce non-native pests, which then helped native plant life to rebound. So in other words, there's lots of science that GM crops are great for the environment and pose no health danger whatsoever. So in other words, if you care about your safety, your food supply and the environment, you should support genetically modified crops. Another large point of divergence between what science has found and public opinion is about the supposed benefits of organic farming. When you usually ask people why they like to buy organic produce or meat, it's because they believe it's more nutritious, it's better for the environment, and it's more sustainable for the local economy, helping support local farmers. And in fact, science has found that all three of these assumptions are patently false. Just like with GM crops, there have been thousands of studies on organic food, and likewise, there have been meta-analyses that gather all this data and look at it as one to see if there is any benefit to growing organically. Some of these meta-analyses have also been done by some of the most prestigious universities in the world, Stanford and Oxford being two of them. And these studies have found that organic food contains no more nutrients than conventionally grown food, it actually contains more toxic chemicals, such as mercury and arsenic, than conventionally grown food. And most disturbingly, they found that organic food is really horrible for the environment compared to conventional farming practices. To understand why this could be the case, we first need to understand what the term organic actually means. It literally means that a farmer cannot use any chemical or synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. And that might sound like a good thing. It seems more all natural. But what this means is that farmers have to use farming practices that haven't really been in use since about the 1950s. So in other words, organic farming is farming without the aid of the past 65 years of scientific advances in agricultural science. And this is a very dumb idea, to put it mildly. There have been great advances since the 1950s in making pesticides and fertilizers far safer for you and for the environment. For example, the kind of pesticides and fertilizers that are in use now break down very quickly so that they don't contaminate groundwater or surrounding soil. 
They also wash off fruit and vegetables very easily so that you don't end up consuming them. And they contain less heavy metals like arsenic and mercury. So by growing produce organically, farmers are actually exposing the ground and surrounding environment to really dangerous chemicals, although they are non-synthetic. But the biggest danger to the environment just has to do with how unproductive and inefficient organic farming really is. Studies show that organic farmers have to use about 87% more land to produce the exact same amount of produce. So more land use, of course, means less natural habitat, a lot more water consumption, and more CO2 spilt out by farming equipment as they do their work. It also means more fertilizers and pesticides that have to be applied, and again, these pose a significant danger compared to modern fertilizers and pesticides. This is why most environmental scientists say that we should never adopt organic food practices in the mainstream. It would be detrimental to our environment, and also it wouldn't produce enough food to actually supply our growing population. And as we've seen, it might even be toxic. Unfortunately, this type of information rarely makes it into the news media. It's not very sexy or interesting to present a story about how organic food isn't as good as people thought and GM foods aren't as dangerous as people thought. Also, the organic food companies, which actually aren't local farmers, they're the top three food producers, Heinz, Monsanto, and PepsiCo, they've turned organic farming into a $65 billion business in the US alone, and they spend a lot of money to protect the validity of this idea that organic food is good for you. One example of this is they've started funding research groups that then conduct their own studies on the benefits of organic farming. And not too surprisingly, these PepsiCo, Heinz, and Monsanto sponsored research groups tend to find that organic food is much more nutritious and better for the environment than conventional food. But who are you going to trust? Research companies that are often sponsored under the table by these organic food growing companies, or reputable research firms like Stanford and Oxford who are independent and have nothing to gain either way. But in the end, research shows that no matter what scientists find, the public tends not really to care one way or another, unless it coincides with their own personal beliefs. This was originally found way back in 1979 when the psychologists wanted to see how science affects public opinion. What they did is they crafted an article showing that capital punishment wasn't a good deterrent against crime, and then they exposed people who already had pro-capital punishment or anti-capital punishment beliefs to this article. So as you'd expect, people who came in anti-capital punishment and read a research article about how capital punishment isn't effective left the study with even stronger anti-capital punishment attitudes. But surprisingly, those who entered pro-capital punishment read the same article and came out with even stronger pro-capital punishment attitudes. The reason for this is that being confronted with this disconfirming information makes people bolster their own beliefs. People don't like to be disproven by scientists, and oftentimes what they'll do is just discredit the science and think of more reasons why their beliefs are true. So in general, whenever beliefs are confronted by scientists or just by a person on the street, people tend not to change their own opinions, but actually strengthen them. This is called attitude polarization or belief polarization. It's this idea that if you get two people in a room who hold opposing beliefs and they hold a debate, they're actually likely to become more polarized after the end of the debate, each believing their own side of the story that much more. This explains why studies have found that the US is becoming increasingly polarized politically since the advent of 24-hour news networks, which spend a significant amount of time discussing and debating potentially controversial political topics. I often run into this problem of attitude polarization in my classes. For example, when I talk about lots of studies that show that playing violent video games causes subsequent increases in violence and aggression, it doesn't matter if I talk about the hundreds or thousands of studies that have shown this demonstrably using good controlled experiments because half of my audience are avid gamers. They love violent video games. And a study has recently shown that when you have avid gamers read these types of studies, they end up actually forming more positive attitudes about violent video games but more negative attitudes about science and the scientists who did those studies in particular. So you may be asking yourself, is it totally pointless for science to try to change public opinion to reflect actual truths? While science might not be able to affect pre-existing attitudes, there's lots of studies that show that scientific evidence can actually be very convincing toward people who haven't yet formed their attitudes, basically people who are still a bit open-minded about a topic. This is why I love being a college professor, because I get to work with young people who haven't really crystallized their attitudes in a lot of ways yet. Unfortunately, studies show that by around age 30, we tend to have pretty cemented attitudes that go relatively unchanged from that point forward. So it's likely that the scientific findings of today 
are going to have their biggest impact on younger people, which will then have more of an effect on public opinion down the road when that young generation grows up and becomes business owners, politicians, and media moguls. This is usually how changes in public opinion occur. A great example of this can be found in workers' rights. So if we go back way back to the 1830s, there really weren't any workers' rights to be thought of. But around this time, some young people had the crazy idea that there should be certain things like overtime pay and child labor laws. So it took about 20 years for these ideas to become more mainstream, and another 20 or 30 years before they started to become state and federal laws. At that point, in the 1870s, this crazy new idea called workers' compensation started getting into the minds of young people. This idea that if you get hurt on the job, you and your family should be compensated. Again, this idea took another 40 or 50 years to become law. Then at that point, in the 1930s, young people started having this crazy idea that women deserved to have the same access to jobs as men. Then flash forward to the 1970s, and it started to get more concerned about things like equal compensation for men and women. And the process continues over and over again. In other words, major changes in public opinion tend to take about one or two generations to pass. In other words, about 25 to 50 years. So it's likely that scientific findings of today are going to have their biggest impact on public opinion 25, 50 years in the future. So you might be saying to yourself, well, that's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to get old and get stuck in my ways. I'm going to change my opinions to fit the times. Well, consider this. Would you be okay with people falling in love and marrying robots or artificial intelligence systems? Would you also be okay if your teachers, lawyers, and doctors were also replaced with artificial intelligence systems? Or if AI systems became business advisors, stockholders, or even political candidates? Would you be okay if the government banned driving due to safety reasons and only let computers drive cars? Would you be okay if they banned all livestock farming and the only meat you could buy was grown in a laboratory? Would you be okay with people uploading their memories and personalities into computers and then ending their biological lives to live a much better existence in virtual reality? Would you be okay with genetic manipulation of offspring so that people can have babies that have super high IQs, are super beautiful, and have every trait that their parents wish for? Would you be okay paying taxes to support government programs to make sure that impoverished families can do the same? Over the next 25 years, it's likely that at least some of these ideas will become reality. And when they do, what will you do? Embrace these new ideas and new scientific advances or rail against them, wishing for the good old days? The choice, my friend, is up to you. If you want to check out the science for yourself, go to my blog at psychologyvidcast.com. There you'll find links to all the studies cited here.